the, all this is so much a game of uh, your mind. Absolutely, seventy five percent game of how I was strong here. Can you prevent something like this? So, answer is both yes and no. So, if we analyze the cancers, most of it is random, even called a bad luck hypothesis. This is Zen Brain where we have conversations about stuff that we have difficulty talking about, from becoming more self-aware, understanding our patterns of behavior, understanding the science behind stress, trauma, mental health issues, bullying, depression, anxiety, OCD. We've also talked about addictions, mental illnesses, and disorders. There are about 100 videos for you to watch, and you can watch these videos by going to zenbrain.com or visiting our YouTube channel. And now you can also listen to our podcasts on Spotify. Now, today, we're discussing what I've avoided talking about for many, many years, which is cancer. I lost my only brother to a very rare case of cancer a few years ago, and there were no major symptoms, really. But the diagnosis led straight to stage four cancer, which had already spread or in medical terms metastasized. We lost him eight months after his diagnosis. And I guess that's why I'm constantly looking for good stories, people who beat the odds and have overcome cancer. Another thing I quickly want to bring up is this. Whenever we go to a doctor, any doctor, and they prescribe five tests, we often dismiss it or blame it on our healthcare system becoming commercial. But going to a good doctor or hospital early can save your life or the life of your loved one. So do not ignore symptoms. And the reason we are discussing these topics and will continue to address it is to be able to, in our own little way, spread awareness about stuff that we ignore, sometimes deliberately, which we shouldn't. Main purpose, however, is to normalize these conversations around things that we don't want to talk about, especially cancer. Now, Rajneesh Singh, you can see him here, in July of 2021, had a few symptoms, went to a doctor only to be diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. Now his cancer had metastasized or spread to the liver where they found a spot. He underwent a successful surgery where his tumor was re removed suc successfully, incidentally by Dr. Agarwal, who's also here with us. And since then, Rajneesh has undergone chemotherapy and was then put on oral chemo meds, which he's completed. And he's also written a book called The Good Patient that I request you to read. Let's talk about Dr. Nikhil Agarwal. He's a gastrointestinal and hepatobiliary cancer surgeon. Just to break it down for our own understanding, the gastrointestinal system includes our esophagus, the stomach, pancreas, the small and large intestine, which leads to the colon, rectum, and the anus. And hepatobiliary is largely the liver, bile ducts, and uh, the gallbladder. I hope I got that right, Doc. Perfect. Okay. Thank you both for joining me on Zenbrain. And let's start with a very good patient. So, Rajneesh, what makes you think of yourself as a good patient? <laughs> yeah, so I, I think... <clears throat> As a patient, uh, there is a mindset and an attitude that you need to carry. Uh, and if you are suddenly uh, hit with a, a disease like a cancer, um, the very normal thing to expect is that you know you'll get nervous, and uh, you know um, for some people depression sets in very smooth, very quickly. Um, those were the last things on my mind when, when the whole thing was told to me. Um, and I, I for a minute, I had smiled and I asked the doctor, Dr. Vikas Singla at, at Max Hospital. I said, are you sure that this is happening to me? You know, and for a minute, I thought a guy like me who's like, you know, happy with life and, uh, you know, there's so much of excitement, enthusiasm all around. I thought, how could this happen to me? Uh, but then, uh, you know, the important point is how quickly you accept the news and, and then you process it and, and then you figure out, okay, uh, so if this is the news, uh, then quickly you move on to the next stage. And so I asked Dr. Singla, what's the next stage? And that's when I got referred to Dr. Agarwal. It, it's not about getting too bogged down with a news like that. 
if I may call in your terminology, breaking news. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it, it was definitely a breaking news in my life. And uh, so, like I said, I mean, it, it was the way one was approaching it became very critical. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then a lot of thoughts came about, of course, I remembered my father who also had passed away due to cancer only mm -hmm. in 2000. So naturally, those things flashed in my mind. And, and I asked Dr. Agarwal also, is this hereditary? And he had quickly, you know, dismissed it. Look, this, these are not uh, hereditary at all. And, you know, if things like these have to happen, they will happen. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, that was where we were, Shruti. And uh, I think by the time I had reached uh, the stage where I was getting uh, admitted and just before the surgery date, at night, I clicked, my wife clicked this lovely picture, my me sitting on the bed and beaming away, you know. And that night, I broke the news on social media and half my friends thought I was joking. But there I was sitting in a patient attire and in the morning, Dr. Agarwal was to do the surgery on, on me. So, uh, so I think that smile itself, a lot of people have said this, the good patient, the cover itself is so much of positivity yeah. that you get to immediately figure out that, you know, there is a different way of tackling such, uh, you know, things in your life. Dr. Agarwal, by the time patients come to you, it's pretty much, you know, surgery stage. Rajneesh, I mean, yes, he had a major symptom in the sense that he had blood in his stool. How can you prevent something like this from happening? Can you prevent something like this? So answer is both yes and no. So if we analyze the cancers which uh, we get, so most of it is random, even called a bad luck hypothesis. Right? And then there are risk factors. So like say for an example, since we're talking about colon cancer here, so diet, right, Western diet, a diet which is uh, rich in say fat and carb, uh, lack of exercise, smoking, alcohol, obesity, these are some of the risk factors. So these are all, you can see, modifiable risk factors. You can control your diet. You can do regular exercise. You can reduce your weight. And then there are some non-modifiable risk factors. Say, for an example, your, uh, uh, which place you belong to, which uh, race you belong to, whether your father had colon cancer or your first degree relative had colon cancer. And these are non-modifiable risk factors. Now, if you have these risk factors, they increase your probability of getting any cancer. Right? It doesn't mean that you will get colon cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, say uh, a better analogy which I uh, use to explain it to patient is that, uh, or even healthy individuals, is that suppose you're driving on a highway and if you drive a, a, a little fast and maybe a little rash, your chances of landing up in an accident is higher. But if you drive very carefully, it doesn't mean that you will not get accident. The probability will be low, right? So these are the risk factors. But like, as I said, the probability will be low. It doesn't mean probability will be zero. So even if you do not have any risk factors, you might get uh, any cancer. And that uh, risk probably, I mean, depending on the cancer types and all that is approximately 50%. So half of the cancers are just randomness. You just get hit by it. Mm -hmm. So yes, we can prevent if we adopt a healthy lifestyle, a good lifestyle, we can decrease our risk, but we cannot totally do away with it. Every time you have a symptom uh, and you look up Google, it leads you directly to cancer. That is also fear mongering, which we do not want to do. What are the symptoms that you need to worry about? We as clinicians or even uh, health organizations will want to create awareness about the symptoms. How much it impacts, it's difficult to say because many of the cancers will uh, not have that many severe symptoms. They will diagnose, they will have mild symptoms. Sometimes they'll be totally asymptomatic. But at the same time, there will be many patients who had symptoms which either they ignored or their clinicians ignored. Obviously, we cannot be worked about worked up about each and every symptoms. Life will become un, in, uh, you know livable and miserable. Absolutely. So generally, I say you should know about the symptoms. And if they persist, and they don't go away. And there are some symptoms which are more alarming, say weight loss, 
loss of appetite, uh, feeling weak, and these kind of symptoms with the symptoms like say blood in the stool or uh, having altered bowel habit. But one or two episodes of altered bowel habit is okay. So you eat outside, your stomach get upset, fine. You have persistent symptoms for few months and they are not going away with regular treatment. That is the time you should get worried and seek uh, I mean, obviously, you should seek when you have some symptoms also, but then you should seek higher level of health care. Persistent symptoms, that's what is key, right? It's not just symptoms once. Also, blood in the stool does not lead you directly to cancer. Uh, it could be other reasons, but better to discuss it with your doctor yes. right? instead of ignoring it. What is the worst that can happen? He'll tell you to go home and not worry about it, right? That's better than realizing a couple of months later that there is something serious happening. Rajneesh, tell us about your symptoms. Were you worried that this was serious? And did you straight away go to the doctor? So, you know, I had a little history of uh, what I would call. So there was this little noise in my right ear, which is still there. So there is a kind of a vertigo related uh, thing that was there. Um, and this was about 10 years and also, and there would be these bouts of, you know, a lot of sweating and then huge vomiting and stuff. And then I got that figured out through an ENT and lifelong medicine was being given. I was taking all that. Exactly two years back, it was July only in 21. Um, and I suddenly started seeing a different pattern in my bowel uh, uh, movements. Uh, and, and so uh, there would be loose motions um, and which, like Dr. Agarwal said, if I had eaten out at times, the food would impact, the oil would impact or whatever, you know, the spices would impact. Uh, but like he correctly said, it persisted, right? So within July only, I would have had, you know, probably two, three episodes. And that's when I, I contacted my GP and she started giving me normal medicine based on whatever she could here and this was all on a, on a call because you would remember we were still on a, a pandemic kind of mode those days. Mm -hmm. So I had not met her in person. So this was absolutely happening on, on calls and things like that. And about mid of July is when I had then these two, three bouts of severe vomiting, right? And the vomiting was so severe, I thought, you know, I'll just collapse uh, in, in the loop. Uh, it was that bad. Um, and so again, I told my GP that this is happening now. So she changed the medicine. Then she said, okay, let's do a blood test. And, and the blood test happened. I think she was broadly then still okay. She prescribed, changed some medicines and things like that. And then we continued. Uh, I remember very vividly, 23rd July, I was at a dinner in, in Gurgaon. And I come back uh, and I didn't feel like eating that day. Uh, so I had very light meal at the party and I just came back. And I think in about... Two, three days time, I noticed uh, blood in the stool. Now, that is when I again called up my GP and she said, look, this case is now beyond me. And you got to immediately meet a gastro specialist. I simply picked up Google and just, uh, you know, typed nearest uh, gastro specialist and Max showed up right at the top because we live in Sake. Mm -hmm. And this was Dr. Vikas Singla. So, uh, and so by 28th July, I was sitting in front of Dr. Vikas. So in the entire month of July, around this time till about 28th, so many episodes had happened. Mm. So I, I want to talk about this a little bit. You know, mm. we always as Indians want referrals, want recommendations mm. of doctors. But yeah. you did not know a gastro. You went there and, you know, everything was, everything so far has worked out pretty decent. Yeah. I, I want both your opinions on this. No, so I, I think, look, uh, it's not that, uh, at least for me, it was the first time going to a max for a problem like this. We had always got good experience of not only the doctors, the entire team. My sister is a doctor. She's in U.S. So I did connect with her that this is the name I've got and I'm just going. She said, yeah, yeah please go. First meet and then, you know, if you get the comfort factor, we take it forward from there. Mm -hmm. And my first interaction with Dr. Singla itself was so interesting that I just decided that, you know, uh, this is the place and this is the person I'll, I'll take things forward with. And trust me, it worked so beautifully through and through. All the three doctors, I keep telling people, if you, if you, if you start taking too many opinions, right. you'll get lost. And, and, and you are 
eating away the time, which, right. which probably you don't have much. Absolutely. So I think it is important that you move fast. So maybe one or two reference is good, but you got to take quick, swift action. Dr. Agarwal, let me come to you. What is your advice to patients, even if they don't know doctors? So difficult question. See, expertise is not distributed evenly. Two, the problem is that uh, uh, we don't have good credentialing mechanisms in our country. Like, say, for an example, I am a GI HPV oncosurgeon. So uh, there is no credentialing per se. We have degrees, but the quality of education in each place differs. So you can have, you know, different doctors with very good training, moderate training, and a training where they didn't get exposed to much in their training. And post that, what kind of experiences they've accumulated, and plus, obviously, the individual brilliance and uh, commitment to their patients and all that. This all differs. Now, obviously, finding out the right person is very important for your treatment. And uh, obviously, uh, going to many doctors and seeking many opinion is not uh, worthwhile because you get more confused. Medicine is not like uh, mass. So two plus two, it never four. So you will not get exactly the same opinion from everywhere. And choosing which is the exact right opinion is difficult because sometimes we even don't know. But at the same time, we should be very mindful of the fact that obviously credentials, experience and the infrastructure should be okay. So that much background check should be there. When a patient is already coming to you, like it, it's that stage where he or she is already ready for surgery, right? They've got to trust you completely instead of like going back and forth because time is of the essence. See, time is of essence, but at the same time, I said that we should not be jumping to any procedure in the sense that I don't think taking second opinion uh, is bad. Maybe uh, Rajneesh ji was lucky that he was at the right place, but not everybody is that lucky. Mm. So you have to, you know, uh, take some opinion or at least if you have some friends or family who's a doctor, that helps a lot because they can tell you who's the right person just by looking at the profile, like mm. what you have done so far and where you've worked so far and what kind of institution you're working in. So that is important, right? Uh, and uh, as far as delay is concerned, sometimes it's the other way around. Patients will come and say, I want it done quickly. I say it's not, we have to do the due diligence. We have to complete our staging workup. We have to get the required information. We have to do the basic workup, right? So both thing is there, but sometimes you have some logistic problem, like, you know, you have to sort out things in your life. So they asked me this, like, can I take a week? Can I take 10 days? I said, I will say, see, this is not an urgent or an emergent surgery. This is not like a road traffic accident. We have to act immediately. So I have to do my due diligence. You do your due diligence, sort out your logistics and then do it. So it should be as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. That's the word I use. And I would again fall back on my own uh, experience with uh, with the, uh, with first, especially the two doctors initially, Doctor Singla and Doctor Agarwal. Like he correctly mentioned, you know, uh, the whole staging, the whole test phase, and also the next ten days from a uh, twenty eighth July to say about eighth of August. Uh, I went through every possible test to just ascertain. Uh, Doctor Agarwal insisted after Pet City that I also undergo MRI. Uh, just to ascertain and confirm that, you know, uh, there are issues there uh, and things have moved from the intestines to the liver. Um, and, and you know, undergoing that stress test, whether you can take a, a surgery. And so I think every little phase uh, and stage definitely helps mm. uh, and, and gives it gives a clear picture to both the patient and the, and the doctor, you know. And, and both of us need to be on the same page. Mm. Uh, I think my naturally whatever reports would come out i would immediately whatsapp them to my sister in us and so i would be immediately getting another opinion that this is what is coming out i think i i do agree that you've got to and he's very correct that you should not be just jumping into it and and really rush the doctor that you just do this you know and so who who the hell am i to tell a doctor that you just do this right now you know i i just can't be as a patient in that position pushing a doctor to do something for which he is saying that a due diligence is actually mandatory mm -hmm. and it is required. 
So I think picking up the elements from the good patient again, Shruti, I, I just went with the flow with whatever they said, you know, never a question. So why are we doing this? So like you said, probably I was lucky and, and you know, everything that was being prescribed to the absolutely to every little word, I would just religiously follow. But were you ever tempted because your sister, like you said, was a doctor in the US to actually go to the US for treatment? Or do you see that, you know, our hospitals and our physicians are as equipped, if not better, you know, to carry on uh, surgery, so that, not just surgery yeah. but the entire treatment? No, so that's a very, very good question. And uh, so we had that situation. And when I would send these reports and the final recommendation that a surgery needs to happen ASAP. And whatever she could read there, she said, whatever is happening there will happen here. You are at the right place. You don't have to come to the US. Mm. And you got the best of doctors. They are exactly saying the same thing what we would have said. So there is no need to come to, I mean, on the contrary, she came down to be with me, you know. Wonderful. So, you know, so I think that trust, even for a person so many, you know, uh, kilometers away, miles away, she could still sense that probably I was in the right hand. Uh, I'm sure she figured out uh, within her network, she would have checked in India as well. Right, right. Uh, so I'm sure uh, coming from her naturally, you know, uh, there was an absolute uh, decision that, you know, there's no point going to US. I could have gone. She lives in New York. So everything yeah. was absolutely a simple thing. You know, I could have just flown out. But we just stayed put and, you know, things worked out. That's interesting because Dr. Agarwal, I'd like to ask you, especially where cancer is concerned and in the GI tract or, uh, you know, the liver that you handle, uh, do you think the protocols are pretty much similar all around the world, right? And are we in India at par? So, uh, Shruti, uh, there are two ways we can look at it. So, broadly, if you uh, talk in terms of overall public health, obviously, we are not there, mm -hmm. right? An average individual in our country will not get the same level of care which an individual uh, in a, a well-to-do country will do. But, I mean, for people with resources, mm -hmm. we are there. So, you're saying if, if you can find yourself a good hospital, with good physicians, you are at par. Yes. Perhaps, uh, you know, more awareness about these protocols in smaller towns would be more beneficial. And you feel that we are we are getting there, at least to the second tier towns, right? We, we are getting there. I mean, so there is asymmetry, a lot of asymmetry, like not only two-tier, three-tier symmetry between uh, even uh, like different parts of the city and different strata of the population. But yeah, for most of the country uh, institution, which are as tertiary and quaternary level of care, they have same uh, standards of treatment and same set of protocols. See, medicine is like kind of practice with what we call it today, evidence that. So it's not like, you know, I will do this or somebody else will do this. We, we look at the trials, we look at data, and then we choose what is the best treatment for a particular patient. Now, in today's information uh, era, there is no lack of information. I mean, any study is conducted anywhere in the world. We get access to those studies. We get access to those data. Same uh, the availability of drugs, equipment. Everything is now uh, easily uh, like available everywhere. So uh, because of this advancements today in technology and infrastructure and everything, most of the world where the resources are there is almost like able to deliver the same quality of care uh, everywhere. Do you see that changing for the better in the years to come? Perhaps uh, the, the awareness moving to small towns. So even if they don't have hospitals or, you know, doctors equipped to handle it, they know they can come to certain places in the country to avail of those facilities. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Now let me ask you something. Let's get back to the good patient. What, according to you, Dr. Agarwal, makes a good patient? <laughs> so uh, I, I would say every patient is a good patient <laughs> and I mean it I, I actually mean it See, Absolutely. because uh, you know when, when you are sitting across the table uh, the patient is the person who is trying to save his life right so they come with their own inherent thought processes own inherent biases fears and there are so many things in the background so I might not like something about some patient that you know you're asking too many questions or you're taking too many opinions 
but i don't know their uh, you know uh, socio economic background what they are coming from what kind of fears they have faced in life right so it's actually my duty to make him uh, comfortable and uh, you know kind of build that trust from whatever background whatever thought processes they have so i look at it this way it's my job make him feel a good patient mm -hmm. uh rajnish yeah so i i do agree with him i mean for a doctor every patient is is good there's no doubt about it uh, unless and, and and i'm sure dr agarwal does uh, encounter some patients who can be difficult also it it's not that every case is like a smooth uh, ride um, I, and i have seen some patients really you know uh, on the side really tell me but you know why are you talking so much so nice about max and all i have had this experience that experience so there are patients who have had their own set of experiences and so they have arrived at x y z conclusion if you start thinking too much about the problem the more you indulge in it that is where you know then you start losing control of the whole situation i think it is important to uh, submit yourself to an expert and then just follow their instruction mm -hmm. right um that is where you know when i started journaling i think that is where the title came in that you know i've been such a wonderful guy just walking in exactly on the time waiting for an appointment never delayed you know uh, and going by whatever advice prescriptions are being given till date you know so i i just follow it like a absolute direction that is being given um and i think the other thing that is that counts for me as a good patient is the entire like i said very at the beginning the, the mindset that you have because the, all this is so much a game of uh, your mind you know how strong you keep yourself mentally uh, and and you talked about the whole mental wellness and all for me the entire uh, episode has been a absolutely 75% game of how i was strong here the more mentally was uh, i was really in control of myself it was easy to handle the whole situation but very quickly tell us what exactly is this mental strength is it overcoming your personal fear you know it it's also shuti i mean i am also a human uh, it's not that there was no fear uh, there are multiple layers to the fear uh, there is that immediate family so you got your wife your son mm -hmm. uh, you got extended family then siblings out there and then of course because i run my own hr firm so being at the head of the firm that's the other responsibility suddenly that strikes you know so what happens to all these three bunch of and then you have this large set of friends right so so i think that one needs to be mindful that there is that whole support system around you which needs to stay strong and so if i weaken they will also start crumbling and and so for me that was the last thing i would want to convey to everybody and that's why probably i went public also i i put it on facebook and just to give a message that you know there is something that has happened but i am in in control of you know rather than going into a shell and cutting off from the world and people suddenly figuring out rajesh has vanished and what has happened something has happened you know you guys go and check with him so i just did it the other way around and i said let me talk about it you know and 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 so let me and so the more and and like you correctly mentioned when we initially spoke that was i gathering sympathy out there not at all you know I, it it was just about getting strength from everyone around and giving back the strength to everybody so i think the mental strength definitely is is like i've been saying it is in your control you you want to stay solidly focused on what needs to be addressed i don't know at times i might sound very corporate kind of a person you know that this was a goal to be achieved and and so you just went into you know in a execution mode and you just worked with the doctors and ensured that everything was sorted like any situation um, you got to stay strong uh, and and i i use the word of called self messaging what kind of message you are giving yourself forget what the world is telling you i think that self messaging is is very very important Uh, so rajnish first of all i uh, would would never think that uh, you are garnering pity first of all i would never think that uh, but it is important also to be able to process and every individual has their own way of processing what they are they are going through currently right you did it through writing and in fact it comes up a lot that writing if you aren't able to process things verbally is the best way to go you know and that is something that you know we on zenbrain always ask people to do is start your journaling 
immediately if not anything all your emotions are there on paper for you to see and you can throw it away but getting back to this doc before we move on to uh, you know the the prognosis itself i want to ask you and since you know we brought up this whole question of asking too many questions or you know having a proactive patient we see very few of them and i've learned through my own experience that i needed them to be aware of what was happening aren't you as doctors happier when the the, the patient is more proactive when the patient understands what is going instead of just going ahead and following your orders well short answer is yes definitely in fact i encourage them to go on internet and read about it uh, i myself have written like most of the questions you asked when should you be worried how to choose your doctor i've written blogs about these things so that people can read about the exact same questions because you know these questions get uh, get asked to us repeatedly in the uh, conferences seminars opd same questions come again and again so i advise them to read about it because it helps because see when you talked about trust so trust comes from that information right so if i say ki aap na ja ke ye operation kara lo it might be right it might be wrong you don't know me so you go on the internet see find out what is the treatment of colon cancer the only advice i ask them to uh, is that read from credible sources don't go and read any crap on internet because anybody can write anything so make sure that it's a government i mean organization health organization reputed doctors personal website and these kind of information so get good information and then process it uh, and then do not get bogged too much about like you know because see a uh, same cancer can have very differing outcomes one depending on the stage and two depending on your luck you should be well aware you should be well read and i am happy when people read and they ask intelligent questions you also attribute a lot to luck don't you that sometimes i i do i do <laughs> i i am a fan of nasim nicholas telev and a lot of data and randomness and all those kind of things so see mental strength is good uh, everything is there but with this you can't beat the disease you need luck on your side getting to your area of expertise the gi tract the liver how is the prognosis early stage so so gi tract i mean as you initially enumerated uh, spans from esophagus to rectum and then gallbladder liver and pancreas so all of them are different disease altogether in terms of prognosis we can't put them in a bucket they they are totally different esophagus is totally different from colon and colon is totally different from rectum so i i don't think i can sum them up in any way they are totally different maybe i can tell you about colorectal cancer because this is one which we are talking about here colorectal cancer are actually you know one of the good cancers i mean cancers can never be good but relatively good cancers we treat of of the all gastrointestinal cancer and for all cancers the prognosis the outcome is stage dependent right so earlier you start treating it earlier you detect it the better is the outcome so stage 1 will have best outcome stage 2 will have slightly worse outcome stage 3 will have more worse outcome and stage 4 will have the worst outcome so these are four buckets 1 2 3 4 but these buckets are also very heterogeneous say like say for an example when we talk stage 4 so again uh, if you you know divide 100 into four buckets so the fourth bucket will be 75 to 100 so there is the 75 there also and 100 there also so we do bucket them but they are all heterogeneous category with different outcome from a patient to patient but broadly speaking you can remember a number like cure rate five year survival rate is the metric we use as a cure rate like if you don't get uh, cancer back in say five years or you survive for five years we generally broadly considers you cured because after that the failure rates are low So stage one, colorectal cancer. That number is around ninety. Uh, two, it's around eighty. Three, it's around seventy. And for stage four, it drops around fifty, sixty. Mm-hmm. So that's the ballpark numbers you can keep. And since you rely on data, let me ask you this: uh, for the for the good patients who make it, what do you see common? What are they doing no, right? So, no, you can't do anything, Shruti. Actually, trust me, you can't do anything. <laughs> if you if you take it well if you are happy it's good for you but actually you can't do anything 
apart from obviously, if you don't follow the treatment protocols, your outcome is going to be bad. If you do something bad with your life, you don't adopt a healthy lifestyle. But there is nothing which you can do which will make commit. See, it's actually, you know, like, let me give you another perspective at it. So if you say, if you do this, the cancer will not come. Or if somebody says, I did this and I beat cancer. So are you trying to suggest people who didn't beat cancer, it was their fault? Mm. Are you putting the onus on them? Mm. No. That's right. They were also doing right. Yes. They were also doing right. Absolutely. No, that's very well put, um, I must say. And we don't at any stage in this discussion want anyone to feel guilty about, first of all, getting Absolutely. cancer, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, like you said, you know, it's it's also, a, it, we, we all live with cancer cells. All of us do, right? Mm -hmm. It's a question yes. of some increasing uh, in, in, you know, more than the others. And, uh, you know, just like COVID, COVID affected us differently. You know, other yes. things affect us differently. And let's never forget that. And uh, let's yes. be compassionate overall. Because, you know, the tendency is always, and, and I know I went through this uh, quite a lot. Um, why don't you exercise? Why didn't you do this? Why don't you do that? You know, you know, those things do come up. But the other thing I wanted to discuss was fear, right? When you actually see a, a loved member going through something, there is absolute fear in any health aspects, any disease, any illness, any symptoms, how does one get over that fear? Not just for the patient, but also caregiver and loved ones around. So different people will handle it differently. Some people will kind of intellectualize it. Some people will have a lot of social support. They will have a lot of people around them. And uh, I, I don't think I can tell you exactly how to get over fear because all of us are humans. But yes, as, as Rajneesh Ji said, talking about it helps. Mm -hmm. it, it does help. I mean, uh, most of the time, actually, when patients come to us in OPD, in follow-up, when we do the round, they just come to talk, you know. Mm -hmm. they, they are not uh, speaking most of the time medical advice. Uh, medical advice, I give them in five minutes. But they spend, you know, 20 minutes in my OPD chamber, 30 minutes in my OPD chamber. When I do the rounds, I talk to them for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. They just want to talk. Mm -hmm. Most of them want to talk. Mm -hmm. So I think talking does help. Rajneesh, let's, let's delve a little bit into fear and how you personally tackle this fear. I would definitely put it more on my life partner, my wife, uh, who was like a solid pillar. And uh, I would sit very quietly in, in, say, Dr. Agarwal's chamber. The most questions would come from her. And uh, whenever, rarely, I would have gone without her, then I have been asked, where is she? You know, because <laughs> Dr. Batra also would want to have a chat with her. You know? <laughs> what is happening with him? You know, and first of all, let me tell you, I don't think ever I felt fearful of the whole situation. Right? I never felt. I don't know why, but I never felt. And, and I somewhere had that little confidence in myself that I will overcome this. You know, so there was that little thing inside, which was very, very clear. But even if there were these little, little, at times, you know, uh, you know, some thought, random kind of a thing. So naturally, my discussion would be with her. And, and, and she being a very, very solid, she said, you know, you just chill and just relax. Don't have to think too much about it. You know, we will, we'll just, you know, get through this. And so I, I think having a very solid partner, uh, in your life, so these things like fear and all can be can be tackled. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in 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 my four siblings, I'm the young youngest sibling. So naturally, my other three siblings were all the more startled and more more worried, and far more probably fearful than me. You know, and I would, you know, being the youngest, I would still give them back a lot of strength. Mm -hmm. You know that you don't have to get too hassled. You know, and and I'll come out of it. Mm -hmm. And today, that is what I hear from my siblings, that we, uh, it's, it's such an uh, interesting example that we never knew you had so much inside you that you could fight out something like this, you know, and, and you become an example that we keep quoting to so many of our friends. So I think, like, like again, Shruti, I would say, if I keep thinking fear, then fear will get inside, right? But if I keep thinking happiness and, you know, life and whatever, memories, I think you you just come out of it. I mean, I, I remember I was in ICU after the surgery and 
you know, uh, I was rolled out of, on a stretcher around 8 p.m. at night on 10th August. And early morning, I was being, uh, through the night, I asked for water. I was never given a water that you're not allowed, not allowed. In the morning, I was asked that, would you like to kind of, you know, sit down? Because I was lying throughout. I said, of course, if I can sit, please, you know, make me sit. So they said, okay, would you like to look out the window? So I said, absolutely. So they removed the bed, they got a chair and they made me sit and I looked out, you know. Now, so for a for a day probably, 10th August was a day when I was almost switched off from the world. Right? I was in his hand, Dr. Agarwal sitting in front of me. And that day I didn't know what had happened. But I think to come back the very next day to be seeing life outside the window was such a kick. You know, and uh, it, it was like being victorious in, in so many ways that you're one, you know. So anything could have happened in the ocean. Yeah, absolutely. And one would have not blamed a doctor that, you know, X, Y, Z, which is what the world does. So like he says, I mean, I strongly believe that uh, the luck factor is such a critical piece in the whole. Thing. Luck and uh, so many things we take for granted, isn't it? Granted, yeah. It just makes you, I think, that morning you you actually looked at the world differently. And absolutely, absolutely. Beautiful world. Uh, let me ask you, Dr. Agarwal, a personal question. I mean, you are dealing with patients day in and day out. Sometimes the prognosis is not that great. How do you handle your mental health? <laughs> so, I mean, yes, uh, it, it's very disheartening sometimes. See, here we are. Uh, uh, sitting with a Rajneesh ji, good outcome, everybody is happy. But but that's not the case always. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to break the bad news also. So some patients are not operable when we see them. Uh, but kind of, uh, you have to dissociate from it at some point of time. So probably coming home is one such landmark piece for us. Like when we are out of the hospital, when we are home, it's not that we forget everything. All the patients who are in the hospital, we will have like all the data about them in our phones. Sometimes we'll get calls also. But kind of you have to dissociate from all these things for a while and go back to your normal life. Mm -hmm. So so that's the only way probably you can uh, handle it. Mm -hmm. And obviously with experience and with uh, initially you get bogged down by so many things. But with, uh, you know, you accept humility, you can outcome is not your hand. So it's basically the humility, the understanding that you don't control everything. There are a lot of random factors everywhere. And yes, you have to keep questioning your process at every every moment that whether something can be done better, whether something can be done, you know, more in a better way, that these are the questions you keep asking and then probably you can sleep peacefully. Mm -hmm. But that's my other thing, Doc. Uh, can you really switch off? Because I see doctors constantly thinking about their patients, the process, what they can do better, uh, how they should tackle things. So... How do you switch off? Like, what is your switch off activity? So reading helps. Uh, obviously, as I said, home, kids, wife, that does help. And uh, I, I don't watch TVs and all that. Like, videos are not my this thing. But yeah, reading and then doing your work, data, reading, even like uh, we read non-medical things, medical things. Uh, for every problem, like when you see a case, if you don't understand some aspect of this, you go back to the drawing board, read about it. So all these things, all these activities, they do help us disconnect from everything. While we are reading, we are thinking about the patient, but in a different way. Like it's a process oriented thing. So you don't get bogged down by emotions, you rather see what's best. So you said you didn't watch videos, but we are going to have to make you watch this video. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, Shruti, let, let me add here. When when Dr. Agarwal's uh, name came up that I'm going to consult him, I did go to Google again and I checked out. He had he has these wonderful videos. Yes, on I've seen them. Colon. You know, I have seen them. So I saw them and then the confidence even grew. So he he, he has done videos. So, you know, that's... <laughs> see, see, Doc, I don't know. <laughs> you put in a lot of those. <laughs> and, you know, one of the reasons why I like to have these conversations and not get into too much of medical jargon is also to show everyone that you are also, at the end of the day, a human being, just like all of us. You know, you do go through Absolutely. your own struggles and, and the fact that you need to break this news to, uh, to your patients day in and day out. So it can't be easy. And I think we also need to empathize so you know before we really end what do we need to keep in mind to stay away from people like you 
adopt a healthy lifestyle yeah. exercise eat well sleep well maintain a healthy weight don't indulge in smoking don't indulge in drinking so that's all we can do we can adopt a healthy lifestyle and that helps a lot like in terms of cancer in terms of cardiovascular diseases in terms of diabetes and like longevity if we talk about so adopting a lifestyle it helps apart from that we actually cannot do much so i mean if somebody is telling you that you know eat this thing or do something specific or maybe do this uh, this is specific medicines no there are unfortunately no uh, magic bullets but adopting a very healthy lifestyle and which we all know which we all know it's not that there is some some gaps there but doc here i want to ask you when we and and on zenbrain this is what we keep telling everybody you've got to exercise whether it is walking whether it is doing a workout yoga whatever pick something of your choice but you've got to do it just like you eat a meal or you brush your teeth you've got to exercise but i want to ask your opinion why do you tell people to exercise what does it do physiologically so exercise uh so like uh, you want to understand exercise from an evolutionary perspective see we were meant to be you know working day in and day out and you know there is a tiger running behind you and you will have short bursts of activity and then you will be running so that's how we have evolved now we have put ourselves into a position where most of us have sedentary lifestyle you're sitting on your chair for most of the day you're working you're sleeping and there is no dearth of like you know from a resource constrained environment we have become into a too much resourceful environment where you have to you know uh, stay away from uh, not sleeping or not uh, sitting or not eating so exercise will you know make your muscles work make your heart work uh, do a lot of activities in terms of you know generating breaking down muscle uh, regenerating them breaking down glucose regenerating it uh, pumping your heart increasing your circulation and and number of changes which happen along with it so exercise helps and the whole process will result in improving your all outcomes cardiovascular your uh, cancer or you look at any outcome it improves and it's not necessary that you follow a particular pattern of exercise any exercise is good 5 minutes fine two days a week fine weekend warriors fine very consistent fine so it has been proved with data i mean people have studied all the patterns which i am talking about in studies compared them so there are people who will you know exercise uh, for two days for let's say one hour and there are people who will do 10 15 minutes every day everything is good right so exercise helps a lot it does so exercise any exercise is good and it's backed by data and nutrition also let me get your perspective on this now a lot of people are going vegan Uh, a lot of people uh, talk about eating more leafy vegetables and and lots of salads and lots of raw food where are you on that so see nutrition probably as a science is very difficult because see when you say science like how things work in our field is that you have two groups of people and you do one particular thing to one group of people and one particular thing to one pre- group of people and then try and compare the outcome and say this turned out to be better now how do you make a group of people eat a particular thing for the rest of their life not possible so nutrition is a very difficult science and that's why you see every few months you will read a newspaper article this thing is good this thing is bad this thing is good this thing is bad this thing is good this thing is bad there's no end to it so what is the solution so a uh, simple solution is that whatever like so you understand the difference between processed food and unprocessed food so when you cook food it goes through stages right so the higher in the stage you get the worse it becomes so if you can you know take out something out of a packet and eat it this is the worst okay so second thing is that uh, you see what has evolved through centuries so you know if some company is coming up with some super food packed in a you know packet and says that you know we've developed this is very good possibly not you will find the adverse effects of it in few years of time right so whatever has evolved through centuries so if you look at any traditional diet in any culture be it indian be it mediterranean be it african all traditional diets are good so what you had been eating for centuries in uh, earliest form of processing that's generally good obviously fat is not bad there was a 
time when you people used to say fat is bad so moderate amounts of fat is not bad moderate amounts of carb is not bad protein obviously is good but if you don't overdo it sugar is bad broadly speaking whatever you, you know you are comfortable eating what is the normal staple diet in your family and if it is unprocessed and what you have been eating for centuries that's good for i just want to add one thing that when i'd gone to a nutritionist a couple of years ago she said every time you look at any food ask yourself this question did your grandmother eat this and if she did absolutely yes you should go ahead i would agree with that yeah <laughs> last thoughts rajneesh what is it that you advise now for people to become healthier what what is what are the things that you want them to do yeah so apart from what has been discussed already um, i think and one thing that i've always believed in travel a lot um, explore different cultures explore different food and and the more you do it and india itself has so much to offer mm -hmm. um, and like dr agarwal was saying that if i was in hyderabad i would look for a restaurant which serves hyderabadi food the way it is done in hyderabad you know so rather than me in delhi looking for a hyderabad food here which is gone through whatever it has gone through so that is one the travel part the experiences part is something that really helps and i and i fully agree with him the exercise part of it uh, this come august and we i have been put on to a one year uh, not one year of a kind of exercise regime mm -hmm. and which i have been following and and i can see tremendous amount of uh, difference that it has made and and so and there also shruti my wife uh, exercises along with me so that gives it uh, uh, again lot of strength that she is also partner in that as well you know so that helps um, and i think otherwise third uh, i love music a lot uh, music is like a you know de stressor for me so my earphones will go up any time and i'll just go into and it could range from a variety of music and i i remember dr agarwal himself had mentioned sometime that he also had lot of interest and things like that so and at home my son uh, our son he is uh, a musician so at home there is lot of music anyways happening so if he is home you know the whole place is like a bar i mean there's loud music happening and we are all busy with our work and stuff like that mm -hmm. i think you, these little little things if one one keeps experiencing i think those itself bring so much of happiness and and food definitely uh, like i have been a non smoker all my life you know and not the only alcohol i would do occasionally was a beer you know i was never a hard liquor person at all uh, and and when i was advised to go off alcohol for these last two years i just went off beer uh, you know which many friends just couldn't believe that rajnish how could you you give beer up and i said no you know this has to be stopped this has to be stopped i think the other big challenge which dr agarwal mentioned is my still kind of hook on sugar it's <laughs> sugar is something that i need to figure out how to you know wean myself away from it so that is something that i keep debating when do i strike this one you know off so let's see wonderful takeaways today uh, we'd like to thank uh, dr agarwal first of all to for taking this precious time to be with us really breaking down medical jargon for us so that we understand it better and uh, i i think you would agree when i say that no matter what the diagnosis let us keep moving forward with the most positive mindset and uh, let try and live every day because life is unpredictable rajneesh I started your book where you start your uh, entire journey by saying that it was your dream to live in a hospital. <laughs> I mean, be very careful what you wish for, Rajesh. <laughs> Not that was my bucket list. Yeah, bucket list item. Yeah, It's a terrible bucket list to have. <laughs> so we are going to be watching your journey onward, and we are rooting for you. we want you back thank you thank you what are the things that we can do uh, going forward what other patients can learn from you and uh, we only wish you the very best so thank you gentlemen for being here with me on zenry thank you very much thank you very much absolute pleasure thank you so much and thank you bye for bye. your service Same here. thank you very much for your service bye bye thank you bye bye, bye.